Hello, hello, everyone. This is your host, Akil Jabbar, and welcome back to another episode of SaaS District. In today's episode, we'll be talking about path to acquisition. We'll get insights from acquisitions from Weebly and Verb. Today, we have our guest, Ryan Glasgow, joining us. Ryan is the founder and CEO of Sprig, a user experience measurement tool suite used by top companies such as PayPal, Coinbase, Figma, and Peloton. Since founding the company in 2019, Sprig has raised $90 million and has achieved a valuation of over $330 million. He has a proven track record in scaling SaaS startups such as Weebly, which was then acquired by Square, and Verb, which was acquired by Snapchat. So he's got quite a few, quite a track record. Um, so welcome, Ryan. Super excited to have you on the show today and learn more. Thanks for having me on the show. Excited to be here. Yeah, so I'd love to hear, you know, maybe start off to share a bit, a little bit about your story what inspired you and your kind of journey into entrepreneurship eventually led to, you know, SaaS acquisitions in your journey with Weebly and Verb? I mean, that's huge. I'd love, love to hear the background there. Happy to. Where could I start? Uh, I mean, background before you started uh, your first your first entrepreneurship journey or how you got started. Maybe that, that would be helpful. Yeah. So always um, was at a very young age, 10 or 11 years old, starting online businesses and teaching myself to code at... 11, I had about a 500 page uh, Java book on my desk at home in my room and, and just picked it up and started to really understand, you know, HTML, CSS, uh, programming, you know, it was in Borland and learning back then, uh, you know, teach myself what it looks like to build software and write software and something that, you know, I was really attracted to. And during high school and in college was always joining start, you know, very early stage startups or starting, you know, my own startups. And it really led to post college uh, starting uh, helping you know start um, a couple of different companies that were pre product market fit as the first product manager and help those companies find product market fit. And uh, throughout those journeys, realize that there is a big need in the market for user insights and for product teams to have a more systematic way to easily collect user insights from their users to really understand what they think, how they feel whether features are meeting their needs or not, and ultimately started Sprig. And so we've been in market for about three years now. We've had fantastic traction and product market fit. You mentioned just a couple of the customers that we work with, uh, but it's uh, just amazing the impact we're having and how many companies we're working with to help them improve their products and their experiences. And so it's been very rewarding as a former product manager, now CEO, to be working with so many other amazing product teams on their own journeys. Love it, love it. So, you know, before we get a little deeper into, you know, how, the conception of Sprig, um, can you tell us a little bit about the journey of, you know, you've worked with startups such as Weebly, I guess, how you were involved in that and the acquisition process with Square, then also with maybe speaking a little about uh, Verb and the acquisition with, with Snapchat? Yeah, so I was, um, had worked at two startups, actually three startups prior to Verb, really helping them find product market fit. And they're all successfully acquired by companies like Ebates and companies like um, Adobe. And so I had some some strong acquisitions there. And I really wanted to go back to the very early days. And so I joined uh, Bobby Lowe, who's the founder of Verb in his apartment uh, here in San Francisco. And it was just myself and him and one other engineer, you know, really hacking away in his, at, in his apartment. And I remember showing up and there was no company name uh, when I joined the company and had uh, a bit of a code name at the time. And we were really focused on solving mobile search and realized that Google had not really innovated or brought a competitive product to the mobile search space. And so I was there for about three years, their first product manager, and also did a lot of their early design work as well, and really focused on uh, building a new innovative mobile search engine uh, for that you can carry around with you. We're really focused on local search, so finding restaurants, places to eat, things around you, connecting with those in the area. And it ended up winning, uh, you know, Time Magazine app of the week. TechCrunch disrupt. We w went on to raise you know, around twenty million dollars, and ultimately acquired for just over hundred million by uh, Snap Inc. And so, a part of the the Snap portfolio now, and they've integrated all the technology and the user interface into the Snap products. And then after that experience, wanted to 
experience the company a little bit further along. And so I joined Weebly post product market fit as their first product manager. And it was a team of, you know, um, a couple dozen engineers and the founders. And, you know, it was uh, still figuring out what it looked like to have a more mature product development org, uh, but also really how to capture the demand that they were facing. And so prior to that, you know, me joining as really engineers and the founders building things and hacking away, but to really turn that into a more mature organization. And so it helped scale the company from about 40 people to around 400 in three years um, and grew it to just under 100 million ARR uh, where I you know, left and took some time off and they're ultimately acquired by uh, Square. And so a uh, really successful acquisition into the Square umbrella. And now it's the Square e-commerce product uh, which is doing really well today and a big driver of Square's growth. And, you know, leaving um, Weebly, I really felt that pain for understanding user needs at scale. And mm. so when I was applying the same techniques from the prior companies of emailing individual users, asking why they were coming back or why they weren't coming back, and really collecting qualitative and quantitative in user insights, you know, at Weebly, we had hundreds of thousands, millions, when I left 50 million accounts and wanted a better way to scalably reach out to these users, understand what's working or not working, really get inside their heads. Mm. When they try a new feature that I just launched, or we launched an all new iOS app, I want to understand as they're trying it for the first time, they, you know, exit out of the Weebly website editor they add their first product to the store, those really key moments, they complete the user onboarding. What are the ways we could have made that better for the next person? Mm. And, you know, Sprig was really um, the genesis of those five early stage experiences and realizing that there was not a great platform in the world for companies that were quickly growing post product market fit to deeply understand user needs. And so ultimately led to to the experience of founding a Sprig. Mm. So it seems like, you know, you've, you've noticed this kind of uh, market demand just by through your, your work and your experience of working at Weebly. And from that kind of spread the idea that, look, we can improve on this. And there wasn't anything out there that was already, you know, offering this or there wasn't anything in the market that was strong enough. What are you guys typically using? What did you start off and what are you using now to really get into the user's mind? Is it, is it forms? Is it, you know, how, how do you get the real insights and not just, you know, what people want me want to hear what they think um, versus what is actually what's best for the company, right? Because sometimes, you know, you can do NPS surveys, you can, there's all, all kinds of things you can do. i um, curious to know what's, what, what you find works best, you know, maybe at the beginning and what you find is working well today now that you're valued at, you know, over 300, $300 million. One of the, at the highest level, I'd say one of the key innovations that we brought to market is that if you think about a revenue the revenue for a company or a top line revenue, you know, gross revenue, it is directionally helpful to understand how a company is performing. But what's really helpful is the full balance sheet. You look at the cash flow, you look at the costs, you look at the gross profit, you know, you look at the cogs, uh, you look at, you know, just how different expenses are categorized, and you look at the net profit as well. And that full balance sheet really gives you the full health of how a company is performing, just because the top line gross revenue is up at the right. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a healthy business that's performing at a high level. And with user experience, we're all relying on NPS. And NPS was a top line metric uh, that was very focused on overall how a company was doing. But as product teams working on specific features or specific parts of product areas, it's really critical that we do have that full balance sheet for our own user experience and understanding the customer journey. Let's look at people that are considering our product or onboarding with our product or people that are newer in their journey with our product or people that are considering leaving and no longer using our product. Let's also look at all the people actively using our product and break it out into separate product areas and look at you know feature A, feature B, feature C, feature D. And with Sprig, we really approach it from first principles of how can we build a full balance sheet for uh, product teams and help them deeply understand all the different parts of their product experience and deeply understand which areas are resonating and working for users. But more importantly, which areas are not resonating or not working? And what are those gaps 
to strengthen those experiences so that overall we have a healthy, successful product experience that is meeting user needs. And so there's a couple of technologies that we are first to market to really accomplish this. The first one is a user targeting system. Mm-hmm. And we just were awarded the uh, patent, a US patent on uh, user targeting for in product service. So it's something that you know is exclusive to Sprig, where you can choose based on user attributes or user events, which users, based on their actions or attributes, receive a given in product survey. And the second one is a scalable way to understand all the data that you're collecting. Uh, when I was at Weebly, in, in one month, we collected over 60,000 NPS responses. Mm-hmm. And you can imagine that all that data went to waste because we didn't have anybody to be able to analyze and review and cate- categorize 60,000 NPS responses. We hear this all the time from companies that come to us. Mm-hmm. And so at, at Sprig, the first person to join me at the company is Kevin, manager, head of AI. And since 2019, we've been working on uh, AI that can group open text data and analyze survey data and group it and really provide recommendations based on that data to these product teams. And so those two you know, innovations are brought to market, the user targeting system to get very specific on asking those specific questions to specific users. And then also, also that uh, the artificial intelligence uh, that we pioneered to understand this data at a larger scale and more, most importantly, deliver specific recommendations to product teams about this part of your product is not meeting user needs or this part of your product is exceeding user needs. And it really helps them give incredible clarity into where they can focus their efforts. Love it. So I, I love that analogy, right? Using the, the cash flow or balance sheet analysis that, you know, people are uh, analogy that people use for, for their financial statements and, and for the, how their c- company is doing as, as a whole. Um, but they're using that for the user experience itself. So it's, I love that. And then, you know, from an NPS perspective, what have you found, you know, any difference in, you know, uh, format of fo- folks who come in who are using NPS surveys and, and getting feedback, and then you're able to analyze it and, and provide, you said, recommendations, um, you know, versus how, how they were doing it before versus, you know, when they start working with you, what are they, um, you know, noticing different that maybe they were missing? I guess, what do most people miss? when they're just analyzing NPS kind of without, you know, a tool like yours able to categorize and really, you know, get into the insights. The biggest miss that we do see is that the NPS factors in both external and internal factors for a user's perception of your product or brand. Mm -hmm. And at Weebly, we had a competitor run a Super Bowl ad and we actually had a drop in our NPS score. And so is that really actionable data for you as a product team to focus on? If, you know, we have some of our customers who have been using NPS in the fintech space and interest rates, crypto prices, you know, external factors will drive their NPS scores more than the work that they're able to do internally by improving their product experience. And so as a product team, if you're focused on NPS, but the larger factors are generally external than internal, it really makes you it really makes it clear that it's a helpful high-level metric, but it's not a metric that you should be really taking action on or overly focused on to understand where to focus your product roadmap. What we really focus on with teams, and we have a really great collection of templates to choose from and really generate inspiration at sprig.com slash templates. What these templates do and what we encourage our customers to do is ask inward questions about specific moments in the product experience. And so as someone adds their first product to an online store, or maybe their fifth product to an online store, ask about how that experience was adding a product to their online store for that merchant. And really hearing from them in that moment, you know, what was confusing, what worked well, were there any features or capabilities that they were looking for? And that's an example of really getting insights for what you can control. If something, if the interface is confusing or it's missing the option to generate SKUs for that product in the way that you're looking to generate SKUs for your product offering, then it's something that you can put on your roadmap. And it's something that you can measure over a longitudinal period of time. And you can look at how is our experience of creating new products for the online store how has it changed from this quarter to last, last quarter or the prior quarter before that? 
Have we gone from a three out of five to a four out of five? Or have we gone from a three out of five to a 2.5 out of five? Mm. And that's really going to help drive and inform where we focus our product development efforts by asking these very targeted questions about our product experience and not necessarily whether we would recommend the brand or not, because that's where you start to get into global, geopolitical, competitive factors that are often outside of our control. That's interesting, right? I like, I like the idea that, you know, you're receiving feedback that are, you know, one of the, in your control, and then there's other noise or anything that are happening around the, the world that you may get confused and think that it's a part of your product and being able to differentiate that and then just focus on, you know, this is what's actually happening. This is what you can control. So what's important, all the stuff that's happening with your competitors in the market, you know, this is, this is it, but you know, you can't control that, right? So here, focus on these things. And then, you know, it helps you understand what's really happening here. And you're not focused on that one number that's dropped um, and, you know, what's actually you need to focus on. Um, interesting. So I, I love to kind of shift gears and talk a little bit on the, the growth side and what's worked for you. Because mm-hmm. I know you're, as a, we have a lot of founders listening at different stages of their startup, but there is a stage where people are in hyper growth stage and understanding that it's a, um, seeing the journey of entrepreneurs once they get to that, it's a completely different skill they have to master, I guess, or learn. But they also have to unlearn a lot of things that you know, the, the way they've managed or the way they've worked from, you know, small team, bootstrapped, et cetera, versus now being at this stage where you're moving really quickly. So curious to learn from, you know, your experience, you've had it several times. How do you manage that? And what are the most important skills you found that, hey, you guys, you know, you should focus on this and maybe stop worrying about this? Absolutely. And there's, you know, in my journey so far, there's been three stages. One, pre-product market fit. We, we were not in market. I was working closely with our design partners, companies like Square, um, you know, very early on and and Robin Hood and really sh- working with them to build our first version of our product and really shaping our product experience mm-hmm. and making sure that a small set of customers were true fans of Sprig and whatever they wanted, we would build. We were very focused on making sure they're incredibly happy with our product and they're both still customers today, uh, which has been, you know, really exciting to continue to partner with them on their growth. And then post-launch, it was really around what I call finding go-to-market fit. And so a lot of companies think that, and founders think that as soon as you achieve product market fit, you know, you're just growing and everything's great and you build it and they will come. But we often realize that we are increasing in a competitive world. It is easier to you know, launch new startups every year and build new products and bring new products to market. And you will have competition, whether it's now or in the future. And it's how do you distribute your product? And so as a founder, you have to get from product market fit, uh, pre-product market fit to post-product market fit. And then you almost have this whole separate journey of pre-go-to-market fit to post-go-to-market fit um, and really figuring out what is, how does your buyer want to learn about, consider, evaluate, and procure your product? And really understanding how Maybe someone is selling to a sales leader, to selling to an HR leader, to selling to an engineering leader, to selling to a VP or C-level down to an end user. Mm. Uh, They're all very, very different go-to-market motions. And really understanding your product and that journey and really working backwards from how that individual, that both that level, both that role, that function, how decisions are made for procuring new software. Um, and so that's been a journey, you know, that I think requires, you know, a, a, it's a pretty steep learning curve, I think, for the founders like myself with a, a, a product background mm-hmm. um, and something that is incredibly important to focus on and realize that for post-product market fit companies, the difference mm-hmm. between those that get to you know, get really stuck at five or 10 million ARR and those that get to hundred million plus ARR are the founders that can really learn and master that go-to-market motion. Mm. I think the third phase is post go-to-market fit is really scaling that go-to-market engine. And so you figure it out, go-to-market fit, you figure it out how your buyer wants to learn, evaluate, consider, and purchase new software. You now need to build an engine that can predictably, reliably, consistently scale quarter over quarter. And so what is the process and playbook from both 
and distribution and awareness perspective with your marketing team, but also the sales process for the evaluation and purchase of the software, where every quarter you can consistently grow at, you know, X percent. Um, And so that's really that third phase that, you know, often requires a whole different mentality around Mm -hmm. processes, playbooks, repeatability, and really thinking about how you can find that next lead, find that next qualified opportunity, hire that next salesperson, hire that next SDR, and have that consistent, efficient growth uh, going forward. Love it. And and can you just share quickly, you know, what's, what's have you found to be, you know, working best at this stage? You know, you've, you've uh, you know, kind of narrowed down your go-to market strategy, and now you're looking into that predictable motion that, hey, if we continue doing this, we will reach X. Have you found anything that's worked or even, you know, what hasn't worked, you can share? Or maybe failed experiments? We have seen in the period of uh, where capital is cheaper, you know, they're certainly easier to grow very quickly. Um, I think, you know, in the period that we're in right now, it is critical to look at techniques and go-to-market, you know, programs that are scalable. Um, And so I can't share the exact ones that, you know, are working really well for us, but we have made considerable shifts in how we build awareness with our product Mm -hmm. um, over the past two years to really respond to, you know, where the market's at today and are now in the process of scaling you know, very efficient go-to-market motion that uh, is working really well to reach our buyer that's efficient and um, growing efficiently and fast. And really checking both of those boxes is critical in the economy that we're in for the foreseeable future. Love it. And that's that's kind of important right now, right? Being kind of disciplined and finding what's working mm-hmm. and stay, stay efficient. Yeah. And kind of curious, you know, you talked a little bit about, you know, you have something called the mixed method research. And, and I know that's kind of part of the product you've developed here, but I'm kind of, kind of curious to understand what does that what does that mean, I guess, if people are looking to try that themselves. For mixed method, method we look at both qualitative research and quantitative research. And mm-hmm. so here it's great. We're more considered on the quantitative research. Mm-hmm. And so an example of that would be a closed-ended survey question. So a user completes an onboarding experience, you know, and a sprig and product survey appears in the product and asks a question like, how was that onboarding experience on a scale of one to five? And so it's a great example of a quantitative experience. One of our customers, Loom, I was just watching a Loom last week and got it in product survey, uh, right in uh, the Loom product. And it asked about my viewing experience of that Loom video. And it was just a simple, uh, you know, ABC question. And I said, hey, I had a really great experience watching that video. And I clicked, had a great experience, you know, just one click. The survey said, thank you, and closed. And that's a great example of a closed quantitative research question. Mm -hmm. And over long periods of time, Loom is now able to really understand how that viewing experience is meeting customer needs. And they're running that survey probably at a very small sample, you know, less than 1% of the users that watch a video. Uh, So it's a very minimal impact, uh, but it's also giving them that insight of how that viewing experience is performing relative to user expectations. Mm-hmm. On the qualitative research side, that's where it's more about the interviews, conversations like you and I are having, asking those questions. And that's where continuous discovery is probably one of the leading techniques of having product teams move customers typically two to five times per week. Uh, five, I think right now is probably a little ambitious given a lot of teams are you know, resource constrained, but two or three calls is a great target. And finding a systematic way to get in front of customers on a weekly basis. We do have some really great templates in our template library for in-product user recruiting. And so we have a couple of templates that you can run with Sprig right in your product experience. And you can run some screener questions, you know, uh, help us understand, you know, a, a specific, you know, tell us about your role. You know, are you uh, role A, B, or C? Okay, great, your role B. We love to give you a $50 gift card to spend 30 minutes with us next week. Does that work for you? Yes. Here is a Calendly link to book a time. The user can book that time right on your calendar. And you can block off the times that don't work for you in Calendly. And you can automatically get three to five calls per week with customers that you want to talk to. The customers that meet the roles that you're interested in talking to Mm. or the companies that are on 
plans or subscription levels that you're most interested in speaking with. Um, and so that's a great way for qualitative research. And the qualitative really allows you to go in depth and hear and learn and ask those probing questions about particular product areas. That's why the screening is really important because you can get a very consistent set of users from consistent set of companies to speak to. Mm -hmm. uh, but the quantitative is helpful as well because you do very similar to, you know, KPIs and metrics, you need to understand your full balance sheet. So how is your entire product and all the components of your product meeting user needs? And that's where quantitative research is really powerful. Quantitative research really guides where you should investigate on a qualitative level and where you need to really go deeper and better understand what's not working with that product experience. And mm. so that's why you have the breadth of quantitative that's incredibly powerful to monitor and understand for long periods of time and then qualitative to go deep and deeply understand user needs and then really help shape how to strengthen or level up those particular product areas. Love it. Yeah, that makes sense. And then on the qualitative side, so I mean, you're having these user interviews, you know, getting deep into these conversations to understand their their pain points, what's working, how you can improve your product. And you'll give them a little bit of incentive to, to jump on a call and give you some time. How often do you suggest that teams do this? Um, you said, you, know, you mentioned two to three a week. And, you know, is this the product team, customer experience team? And are they talking to the same folks? I mean, just curious to know your your process, what you recommend to people to, to use. For companies that are later stage that have a researcher, we recommend the researcher pairing with a product manager or product designer, and would love to also see engineers there if possible. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, and usually one or two people joining a researcher, if the company has researchers. But for companies that don't have researchers, usually a company is less than you know three to five hundred people. Then absolutely, it's the product manager who's going to be joining and. It's usually best practice if she's able to record it and then share those videos internally with product designers, engineers, other people at the organization. And the goal with both of those is to socialize the learnings for everybody involved in that product area. And so we have a team right now dedicated to artificial intelligence and any customer insights we can gather, whether it's quantitative insights with Sprig or it's more qualitative in-person insights you know, through conversation, we want those insights to be available to everybody on that AI squad. So we can get the engineers, the designers, and everyone involved in helping really ideate and come to the table with solutions and ideas and work together as a team and realize that product creation and ideation is not just for product management and product design, but it is a responsibility for everybody on that cross-functional squad to be thinking through how they can level up that particular product experience. Mm. And you, know, you spoke about AI. So I'll just leave, kind of wrap up this part of the, the interview. And, and uh, what we talk about is understanding how are you guys, I know you guys using AI right now, you're incorporating into your products, um, you know, the, the things moving so quickly. Um, you know, do you have any strategies you're doing to kind of keep up to date and influence the approach of how you guys are incorporating AI and, and developing it in the innovation side over time? It's really exciting that you know, we were one of the pioneers in the survey category for open text analysis and grouping open-ended responses into themes if there's no overlapping words or phrases. And introducing that, like I mentioned, 2019 is something that really helped differentiate Sprig in the market. And as AI models have advanced over the past 12 to 18, 24 months, we have, there's so many different things that we've wanted to do, but the technology was not ready. And so with the recent large language models, we've been really taking some bets and bringing more new innovations and ideas to market. Uh, one of our most recent launches is a news feed, uh, very similar to a Facebook news feed or a Reddit feed, but all of the feed contents are generated by AI. And what's really interesting is that AI is able to sift through all the session replay data that Sprig is collecting, all of the survey data, open-ended responses, closed-ended responses, trends in responses, emerging themes. And it's able to look through all the data. I mentioned at Weebly, 60,000 responses in a single month. Mm -hmm. We have many customers who get far more than 100,000 responses in a single month. And the AI is able to sift through every single data point, every single user event, every single user attribute, 
every single user response and say, here are the trends and correlations and opportunities and strengths we're finding across all the data that's been collected across Brig and compile that into a real-time feed of insights. And this is what's exciting is that it's really going down to the in-depth understanding of that user experience as you launch a feature, how users are reacting, as you make a, a launch a redesign, how users are responding and whether it's meeting user needs. Um, and we're also launching another new innovation here in just a week or two around grouping the session replay clips into themes and summarizing mm -hmm. those groupings. And so you, we had a customer collect over 6,000 uh, session replay clips. And you can imagine the time, I don't even try to do the math on how long <laughs> it would take to watch all those. But with we figured out with uh, open, with uh, you know these large language models, how to analyze and review all of those clips and say, out of all these 6,000 clips, here are the 18 themes from the user behavior that we've identified. And we're going to summarize each of these themes for you. And so maybe you're interested in a particular theme. You watch 10 to 20 clips of that theme. Or maybe you want to watch 5 to 10 clips from each theme. And all of a sudden, you can quickly understand the broad levels of all of those 6,000 clips in just 10 to 20 minutes. And so we're taking something of, you know, hours and hours of data yeah. and time that's required to, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes to understand all those clips very quickly. And so it's exciting to see how AI is really empowering product teams to deeply understand that user experience and Sprig as the leader in the category. Well, but yeah, that's super exciting. So, I mean, they're analyzing a bunch of videos and able to make decisions or even review them and, and, you know, different how to make decisions in a super short time. I and mean, that's huge. I mean, generally that would take probably a couple of months of work to go through that and then and analyze it, come up with some insights and then come up with recommendations, able to do that in, in, in such a short time. That's amazing. So excited to see mm -hmm. where you guys go. Love it, Ryan. Wanted to um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'd love to kind of shift gears and maybe go towards the personal, more rapid fire questions, if that's cool with you. Of course. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Let's do it. Ryan, what's uh What's one activity you enjoy outside of work that gets you into a flow state? That's a great question. And I think, you know, I've realized in my life, as I take on more professional stress, mm -hmm. you have to find personal activities that are more consuming mm -hmm. of all of your senses and really more consuming of your full attention. Because if you don't have activities that can really match what you might be thinking about mm. or what you might be processing. I'm always thinking about Sprig. Sprig for me is 24 seven, every day, every waking hour, but it's also not sustainable. You do need to take some breaks and think about something else and have your full attention elsewhere at some moments of the week. And so the two activities for me, other than spending time with my family, which absolutely will capture my full undivided attention, um, but the two activities uh, outside of, spending time with my wife and my daughter. Uh, one is fly fishing. And mm. so very, very, uh, it's absolutely incredible at capturing my full attention, you know, hiking waist deep in the middle of a stream, you know, casting out to fish that are, you know, 10 feet in front of you. Uh, it's a very active activity that requires my full attention. And the second one is that I recently picked up, which is golf. And it also, it's very focused on, you know, the full, it captures my full attention. You're outdoors, you're typically with friends or family. And it's something that to hit it a great shot, you re, you cannot be thinking about work, even no, if exactly. I wanted to. <laughs> it's so, just you and the ball, make sure you hit it in it. <laughs> or you and the it, fish, right? <laughs> it, exactly. Me and the fish or me and the ball. But both of those uh, have been really, really great activities for me. Love it. Yeah, that, that's a that's a really good way to look at it. And I mean, like you said, that's why the question, right? A lot of people are 24 seven, you know, thinking about the work, but having that break of time actually gives you a little bit of refresh and you come back with some some new ideas and way to tackle problems. So love it. Yeah. Awesome. Ryan, what's uh, one piece of advice you wish you had known? And if you can go back, you would tell your, let's say your 20 year old self or 25 year old, let's say. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think the thing that it's 
probably folks probably know this, but it's something that you will learn, you know, throughout your career is that things always take longer than you think. And so I think really the patience, and I think there's good impatience, but there's also impatience that can be detrimental. Mm. And so, you know, if your detrimental impatience might be, you know, pivoting too quickly. And I see some startups that shut down and they're pivoting every two months when it's clear, you'll see other companies with some of those same concepts actually stay focused and patient Mm. and you'll see them eventually take off. And, you know, I think in the experience that I've had in my career of finding product market fit, it often takes longer than you think. Mm. And if you pivot while you're making progress, but maybe before you're able to really achieve product market fit, then you start back at, you know, where you started, which is zero. Um, and you might have actually been down a path that, you know, could have been one that was the right path. And so I think that's one thing, that's one example of detrimental impatience. But I think other examples might be if you're at a company um, that, you know, perhaps is going through some twists and turns. On the other side, you're most likely going to be rewarded for that patience and seen through that experience. Mm. And one company that, um, you know, as a CEO of a $20 billion company, and he was sharing that his pet peeve is folks that don't stick out the tough moments in building that company. And the ones that maybe stay for six months or a year or 18 months and say, hey, you know, this company is going through a rough patch. I'm going to quit. And he realized that they, when he looked to hire people with those short tenures who left because of a company going through, you know, maybe a challenging moment is that they didn't really, they weren't able to get the learnings from those moments. Mm -hmm. And if you only experience the highs of a company, it's not really a moment that's going to be transformative for your career. But if you experience and help a company go through a low or maybe pivot or a change in direction, that's really the transformational learning experience. And so he often looked for folks that had those experiences and hired people who had that resilience who had those learning moments that were then incredibly valuable for building, you know, his $20 billion company. And so I think that's, you know, I think for the, the, you know, generation in their twenties right now, um, the patience, seeing things through being disciplined, being resilient is not only a benefit for the company that's going to, you know, have your experience and helping you get to where they need to go, but also you're going to get so much more out of that experience than, a company where you show up and the company is going to be growing, you know, up into the right regards of you're there or not. Mm, I love it. Yeah. Being resilient, I guess, you know, finding for anybody who can you know, go through that or handle that's a, such an underrated skill. I agree. Um, Ryan, what are some of the biggest challenges you're currently facing in order to continue to grow and scale Sprig? Meaning, you know, what's keeping you up at night these days, if, if anything? For us as a venture back company backed by the best, Excel, Andreessen Horowitz, first round capital. I'm always focused on growth. And, you know, how can we be, you know, the best company in their portfolios? I'm competitive. I want to beat the competition, but I also want to be number one, you know, company for our investors and deliver, you know, incredible shareholder returns, not only for the employees here at Sprague as shareholders, but also for our investors as shareholders and doing everything I can to, you know, really maximize. Uh, their returns. And so for us in that hyper growth phase of go to market, it's thinking about we have a core grow to market market engine that's working really well, it's scaling efficiently. And we're also looking for additional programs to layer on. What's going to be the next, you know, phase of growth? How can we layer on that next um kick into it even another gear of mm-hmm. growth? And so that's where we're really focused and what that I'm focused on is you know, spending time with our sales and marketing teams and thinking about what we can do uh, for that additional layer of growth. Yeah. Continue to grow. It's uh, the only way. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, what, <laughs> who or what are some of the best three resources? They can be books, mentors, or people you follow in the space, could be investors, who you'd say have been the most instrumental to your success over these these last three years or four years now. I'll give two authors that have been incredibly impactful in my journey of building Sprig. One of them is at the high level of purpose, mission, 
values of company building and how to build an iconic, sustainable company over a hundred year period. And the author is Jim Collins. So he's known for his book, Good to Great. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of folks maybe have read that when it came out, I think 15, 20 years ago, but one I'd recommend dusting off or picking up a copy and reading through Good to Great. He also has a whole series though on uh, one example is Beyond Entrepreneurship 2.0. Mm-hmm. Um, and that his books really cover how to build the foundations for an iconic world-class company uh, through his analysis of world-class companies. The second one's more tactical, uh, Jason Lemkin, who runs mm-hmm. the Saster community. And his blog and his podcast have been very transformative as I talked about the learning curve for myself as a product founder, learning go-to-market and achieving go-to-market fit and now scaling uh, the go-to-market motion. Uh, He's been incredibly transformative in terms of the hiring of go-to-market team, the metrics, and really the tactics of building a world-class go-to-market motion. Yeah, fantastic books. I mean, uh, you know, Jim Collins. It's been a while since I've, I've read him, and probably a good time to pick it up and you know, a good time to re- revisit because his stuff is, mm-hmm. is golden. So, good good recommendations. Ryan, what does success mean to you today? Whether there it's personally, business, financially, life. I guess there's no right answer, but how do you define it today at the stage you're at in life? It's been very rewarding going from someone as in the on a product team building a product for customers to. Now being, uh, you know, running a company that's helping product teams and empowering product teams reach their own goals. And what kept me up at night as a product manager are those why questions. You know, why were users churning at a higher rate than we expected? Or why were users not completing onboarding? Or why are we seeing an emerging demographic of yoga studios, you know, signing up for a product and and really starting to purchase far higher than we expected subscriptions of our product offering. And so it's been impactful working with some of the fastest growing leading product teams and helping them answer their own questions about their own customer and user base and really unlock what they need to deliver and hit their own goals. And so our purpose at Sprig is making experiences that matter And it's not our own experiences that we're focused on making matter. It's our customer's experience. And so we started working with Coinbase when they're around 600 people, Robinhood around 700 people. And we started working with Loom when they were, you know, relatively early on in their journey and seeing companies like that become category leaders and make an incredible impact on the world. And we like to think we played a small part in their journeys and in their successes over the year. Now PayPal is a company that we brought on last year and we're now rolled out across the entire PayPal portfolio um, and really helping PayPal transact globally and the world transact uh, money globally. Um, that's really what's energizing and you know, for us is really a purpose-driven company. Um, I think success as well, I talked about shareholder value and see myself as a shareholder number one, uh, CEO number two. And so how can I deliver incredible shareholder value for the employees here at Sprig, also for our investors? Uh, but I want Sprig to be a transformative experience for people at the company and for investors, not only in the impact that we're having, but also in terms of the financial return on their time or uh, financial investments. Love it. So, you know, made quite a big shift from, you know, uh, four years ago, product manager, you've, you've been doing well and then moving into the CEO role and seems like you're doing fantastic as well. There's a lot of people listening in, maybe to, looking to take that step as well. Um, but, you know, sometimes starting that project or make, taking that big leap, you know, is usually, you know, usually anxious about, you know, not being good enough or, you know, confusion of what the first steps are. Any kind of final, final advice for them to take that leap and hopefully follow your, your steps? The I, I can't say I have, I have good news here. It's more <laughs> diffi- it's more difficult than you think, and it takes longer than you think, and that's part of the the patience that I was stressing, you know, earlier in our conversation. Right. And you know, going back to Jason Lumpkin, who you know I've learned a lot from. He said it takes a minimum of two years to see for a single product idea in SaaS whether you're onto something or not. And so, talking about that detrimental impatience, can you set aside the next two years? Uh, to try out a SaaS idea 
you know, mm-hmm. to see if you built something that's worth pursuing, it takes 24 months. And so do you have the patience financially, your significant other, your friends and family, uh, in your career, the opportunity cost of your career? You know, is that 24 months you're willing to set aside and commit to and seeing, will this work? Is, am I on to something? Um, and so there's a lot of resources now. And so I think there's opportunities for folks to quickly learn what it takes, but it's really that patience and that resilience that's that's really critical to success. That's awesome. Thank, thank you so much for, for all your great advice, Ryan. I really appreciate this and I'm sure audience as well. Um, where can founders or anyone listening in over an audience get in touch with you, learn more about you or, or check out Sprig as well? Sprig.com. We have a really great template gallery. It's the questions that I would ask our users and customers free product market fit for companies like Verb, Extrabox, LiveFire, Graph Science. And we have over 75 templates. Many of those templates, I would ask those same exact questions to find product market fit at four different startups that were acquired. And post product market fit, Weebly, you know, growing Weebly to uh, just just short of 100 million in ARR, those are also the same questions. The first product manager at Weebly that I would also ask. And so regardless of where you're at in your journey, I'd recommend you check out our template gallery. We also have customers contributing templates. So Coinbase has one in there. Lenny Rachitsky has created a few templates. Ben Williams, who is uh, runs plggeek.com. Um, so check out our template gallery. We have a free plan for early stage founders. We have an a enterprise plan that starts at $10,000 for any company post product market fit. And so sprig.com, definitely check us out, get started for free. Uh, if you're a post-product market fit, you can book a demo and learn more from our sales team. And I'm also available on Twitter. So twitter.com slash Ryan Glasgow. You can follow me there. I would love to hear from you. Love it, love it. Thank you so much, Ryan. We'll add all those links to our show note. Make sure to check out Ryan at his Twitter or sprig.com and uh, check out their templates. So thank you so much again. Awesome, Mikhail. Thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> Likewise, cheers. Thank you all for watching this episode and joining SAS District today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for future episodes where we interview top leaders in the SaaS industry. If you're a SaaS company looking to grow and unlock the true value of your business, get in touch with us at Horizon Capital and myself or one of our consultants will provide a free assessment to help you get there and hit your goals. If you have any feedback or suggestions for this podcast, please comment down below and help us improve our content for you all. Thanks again and see you on the next one.